Hey, it's me, John Ward. I am back with another One Filmmaker, One Film. And today my guest is... Tony Massiello, owner, operator of SOVHorror.com. Awesome. Thank you for being here. I really do appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm a, a big fan of your sovhorror.com uh, films that you've been, you know, like producing, directing, uh, distributing. I think it's really great. And um, can you please tell people what sovhorror.com is? Yeah, so sovhorror.com uh, is a kind of a website devoted to all things shot on video. I started it about 11 years ago as a way to uh, release mini documentaries about shot on video horror films. Um, shot on video horror films were very inspirational to me as a youth and kind of inspired me to get into the film industry myself. And eventually it kind of led to distributing films. We did our uh, first release about two years ago, a lost shot on video movie from 1990 called Metal Noir. And since then we've released, I think I, think I just uh, did release number 35. So we've been cranking out, uh, you know, all sorts of rare, obscure kind of shot on video gems. Nice. And the um, the films that you release uh, uh, through your company, there are they just shot, let's say, on VHS or can they be shot? How, how exactly like what do you look for when you're when you're trying to find stuff to distribute? Well, uh, typically, I, I'm pretty picky at what I distribute, um, so I, I, I don't just put out any movie. To me, it has to be, for one, I have to like the movie, so I have to enjoy the right. movie on a personal level. And then also, uh, yeah, we try to stick to movies shot on video, but we also do uh, put out some DV, so mini DV, you know, kind of the early 2000s mini DV type features, as well as we've even done a film. So we even released a 16 millimeter film, uh, Blood Orgy of the Leather Girls. Um, oh, okay. So uh, yeah, we, we, we special and shot on video horror, but uh, long story short, if it's something really cool and I dig it, I'll put it out. <laughs> and what filmmakers can people see, you know, uh, through the, the site? Uh, as far as uh, the films we release or as far as content on the site? Um, I guess both, maybe. Just like, are there certain names of certain filmmakers that people would be familiar with? Like, who should they look out for? Sure, yeah. So we've released movies by uh, Chris La Martina, who's probably best known for WNUF Halloween special, Call Girl or Cthulhu. Uh, movies by Chris Seaver, who's done like a Diabic Hugh, Death O' Lantern, a lot of Warlock uh, videos, uh, stuff by Joe Sherlock, like Lust of the Vampire Hookers, We Need Earth Women. Um, gosh, so, so many great directors we've worked with. Uh, Tim Ritter. Um, we're, we're about to put out a, a Lost Todd Sheets movie, which I'm really oh. excited about that one. And uh, yeah, so we've worked with lots of different filmmakers. I've interviewed uh, probably about 50 different filmmakers um, and we slowly kind of put out little mini documentaries on the website when, when I get a chance to edit them in between, uh, you know, doing DVD releases and whatnot. And that's that has its own title, doesn't it? It's uh, what is it? Uh, SOV, The Independence. Am I correct about that? Well, the true Independence. Yeah. So yeah. originally that was a documentary, uh, a documentary film I started working on um, about 15 years ago. And what happened is, you know, th there's so many people involved in the shot on video world. I realized this movie is going to be like eight hours long. There's no way to tell the story I want to tell in a two hour movie. And so I've decided to kind of do these little mini web episodes. So that way I can tell the full story behind these movies because I'm such a huge fan. And I know there's lots of other fans out there who, you know, there's not a lot of info out on some of these films. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a, our way of preserving the history and sharing it with, you know, like-minded fans. Yeah, one of the ones, uh, one of my favorite ones of those, because I've watched a bunch of them, is uh, from the director of uh, Blood Lake. Uh, I am a big Blood Lake fan, and um, it's nice to see that that finally actually got like a good release. But um, for the longest time, I thought I was the only person who knew of that film, and then I found out that other people knew of it too. And I was so bummed that it never got like a soundtrack or anything that I actually created my own soundtrack. I, I 
you know, I have the film itself and, and I just went through and kind of cut it all up. And I, I put like a, a song and then some dialogue and then a soundtrack, you know, then a song. And then it just, and it kind of made its own little soundtrack out of it. And uh, cause I'm such a big fan of that. So uh, yeah, it's nice to see wow, that I got cool. represented in it. So. Yeah. Tim Boggs was actually the first director I had approached about the project. When I first started the project, I knew I wanted to get some of these guys who had never talked about their work. And Blood Lake is one of my favorite SOV movies. And I knew, I'm like, I got it. If I can get Tim Boggs, then I'm going to do this project. And I was able to get Tim. And, and Tim was so cool. I sat down and interviewed him in, in his studio that he works in. I mean, it was like an eight hour long interview. And it oh, wow. was... Uh, yeah, it was it was so amazing. <laughs> so much great information and and just such a nice guy. And and I mean, an example of one of these guys who started off just wanting to make movies, you know, made this little shot on video movie Blood Lake. You know, a lot of people kind of piss and shit on it, but as fans, you know, we really love this movie. And and Tim's gone on to like way bigger things. You know, he does like sound design on on big uh, television shows and movies now, and he's had a very successful career. So it, it was a perfect person to be the first person for me to interview for the for that series. Yeah, it's it definitely sounds like it. And um, I don't know why people have, you know, like, like you said, like they shit on it. I don't understand that. It's just it's it, it's a fun film. It's got, uh, you know, there there are long dialogue scenes and then extended pauses and things. But that's kind of what makes it unique. You know, it's not like every other film. So. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan. I still haven't picked up the uh, uh, the actual release of it yet, but uh, I plan on it. So it's one of those ones that's it's not cheap. So it's it's kind of saving a little bit of money. So, but it's great that it's on there. I appreciate that. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's so cool that that finally got released you know, on a nice little special edition. So now. Um, you're uh, so on top of talking about you know sovhorror.com there's uh, which i highly recommend people go to um i own probably about eight of your of your films and i think that they're well worth it um even films that are short um there's a ton of stuff added onto there uh you even have just like a dvd of trailers which i own um i think that's really great to have um especially if, you know if you buy one movie and then that trailer you know dvd you could just pick and choose. You could just go, oh, I want that. I'm going to buy that one. I'm going to buy that one. So it's a great introduction to, uh, you know, to that company. So I, I highly recommend people go out and take a look at it. So, and, and definitely pick up stuff. And you do specials, you do deals. So you did like a 420 deal. You do, you know, you do things like today only. So, you know, prices aren't always the way they are. You could pick up some stuff for six bucks, 10 bucks, so that's really nice to do, you you know, that you do that. You don't see a lot of companies actually doing that type of stuff. Normally they up the prices, but you bring them down for people. Yeah, yeah we try to, you know, one of the things that's really important to me as the fan first, you know, and a distributor second, is I want to put out great packages of these movies. So even the, the shorter films that, you know, a lot of these SOV movies can run, you know, as, as short as 40, 50 minutes. And we try to load them with as many special features as we can you know, commentaries, making of documentaries, stuff like that. And yeah, we try to keep the prices low because uh, ultimately I want people to see the movies. That's what it's all about is just sharing my love for these films with uh, other like-minded fans of the genre. And a lot of them have very interesting titles. Um, I, you know, I just, uh, I heard on the uh, the audio commentary I just listened to for the film that we're going to be discussing about, uh, Zombrella's House of Horrors. So not horror, but horrors. Um, uh, you said that you like your long titles and, and that's one of them. So, uh, uh, which is interesting because I'm someone who likes one word titles like Axmas, Axmas 2, you know, very short titles. And uh, why do you like long titles? You know, why is that kind of your thing? Yeah, so the movie that really kind of got me into B-movies as a kid was I was a big fan of USA Up All Night, and I used to watch that as a kid. I think a lot of people in the late 80s, early 90s uh, kind of grew up watching that, and I was one of them. And I, I saw the movie Sorority Babes and the Slimeball Bowlerama. Oh, yeah. And instantly <laughs> just fell in love with that movie. It's still, it's probably my favorite movie of all time. And so, you know, it has that great long title that always just stuck with me. 
So, you know, since my earliest shorts, you know, I was making stuff like Showering Psycho Sorority Sluts and the Succubus Sleepover Massacre. You know, <laughs> that's like a title. Really that's a title. Kind of <laughs> you know, Cannibal Vampire Cargo Hooker from Outer Space, you know, all these <laughs> a really long title. Um, cause they just thought they were fun, you know, and, and, and it just so happens that some of the movies we've released in the company also kind of have these long titles as well. Well, yeah. And those, those are the titles that you would see at like Hollywood video or blockbuster or like a mom and pop place are these VHS films that have these really long titles. And a lot of times I remember renting them just for the title. The title sounded cool. So I would take it home with me, you know, and, and that's, you know, compared to, you know, Aximus I like, I mean, it, it tells what the film is, but it's not as interesting as, you know, some of the ones that, uh, that you've done. So I don't know, maybe if, the, if those two films came out in the past, I would probably take one of yours over one of mine because your title is more interesting. So, you know, that's, so that's, and with the ones, you know, the films I have sitting next to me here, I mean, they're, they're definitely, I mean, some of these are interesting titles. So we have Die BQ. That's an interesting title. Death O' Lantern. Um, Slumber Party Murder Mania. Then you have your SOVHorror.com trailer Orama. Uh, Natasha Knightley's Bordor of Blood. I even have uh, um, one of the uh, Happy, uh, Happy Holidays. I even got that one too. So these are, yeah, you've definitely got some interesting titles. So <laughs> if it works, keep doing it because it's, it's doing a good job. So, <laughs> so let's get into then uh, uh, Zombrella's House of Horrors. Um, what made you want to do this? What was your, you know, when did you go, boom, I want to make this movie? Yeah, the, the genesis of this movie is a little <laughs> strange because originally it wasn't even Originally, it wasn't even meant for public consumption. Um, what happened was I was editing some old footage uh, from a series of shorts I had done called the Cannibal Vampire Cargo Hookers from Outer Space trilogy. I made three of them. And I was just kind of going back over some old footage and kind of editing together longer sequences out of this stuff. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun if I had someone host this? And it was just for me and my friends to enjoy this. So I had my friend Amy come down who I was in a band with. And I was like, hey, why don't you play this character Zombarella, which was a character name I came out in, up with in college. It was a horror host show that I had an idea for that just never took off. And so I had her play this character and host uh, these kind of segments from the Cannibal Hookers trilogy. And it came out really fun. I thought it was really cool. And I'm like, hey, why don't I do something similar with all my short films? So I'd done a, a, quite a few short films in various movies like I-8, Sleepless Nights, Frames of Fear, Grindsploitation, you know, a bunch of different movies. And I thought, hey, I'll, I'll put something together cool for all, everyone who worked on the movies to kind of have a nice, cool DVD copy of, of the stuff we'd done over the last 20 years. And so that's kind of really the genesis for Zombarella. It was Zombarella's House of Horrors. It wasn't even meant to be for public consumption. <laughs> but what happened, what happened was, so one of the shorts I wanted to include on the movie, uh, due to rights issues, I could not put it on, on the film. I was denied uh, any, I tried to license it. They wouldn't license the short to me or anything, which was a short I made. But so I couldn't get the rights. And so I, I was like one spot empty. And so I was talking to my buddy, Tim Ritter, who's uh, probably best known for the Truth or Dare movies and Creep and stuff like that. Tim's a really Oh yeah, lots great, of good great, stuff. Great yeah, Tim, Tim is great. And so I was talking to Tim and, 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 and asked him if he maybe wanted to direct a short. And he's like, sure, I'd love to direct a short. And around that time was also when the whole concept of doing something like a USA Up All Night really hit me, where it was like, hey, why don't we frame this like an episode of USA Up All Night so there's commercial breaks, you know, filled with the 1-900 sex ads and stuff like that, um, you know, to kind of, at first it was to pad out the running run time, but as we got <laughs> kind of more deep into it, we realized we didn't even have to pad out the runtime. It was more just for that aesthetic of kind of that throwback to you know, up all night and stuff. And so Tim was like, hey, I'd love to direct some commercials too. So we also did some commercials and stuff. And so really it's kind of a, 
you know, so, so, some of the stuff from him is like really old stuff that was never released that he re-edited. And I pretty much did the same. So it's kind of one of those movies, really in a sense, it's like 20 years in the making. It's probably like the last 20 years of my filmmaking is in there and including about a good 20 years of, of Tim's work as well. So. Yeah, it, it's definitely a, um, a kind of like a, a collage of a lot of different stuff, but it's, it, it's, it's put together in such a way that it works. You know, it's not just thrown in there. It's, it's actually kind of layered and makes sense in the way that you do it, you know, which I appreciated, you know, because it is, it is a longer film than, than some of these ones that are like 70 minutes long. And uh, because it's actually put together well, um, it's not boring. It doesn't seem long. It just, it moves. And what you're doing, I'm 53. I remember these commercials when they originally came out, you know, like the psychic hotline and yeah, the sex calls that you could do. And they're all ripoffs. They were all horrible ripoffs. And um, I think I even did a couple of them. I might have even done like one of the psychic hotlines and, and stuff just to see what it was like. And it was expensive. So I appreciated uh, uh, seeing these. Um, so it, it's one of those films that, you know, I, I watched it and then I watched the audio or listened to the audio commentary and was never bored. I just, I found everything that you guys were talking about interesting. And, um, and the DVD is packed with stuff. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's got on here, you know, audio commentary. You also have uh, one of the actresses on here, Alice Rosenberg. You got an episode of Mondo Bizarro. You got some hot deleted scenes, a uh, Zombarella trailer, and you got trailers for, for other films from slvhorror.com. So this thing is filled with a ton of stuff. So this is, it's definitely worth picking up. Um, let's kind of look at the what's in the movie itself so the first one is and and the way that i ha kind of have this broken down is you know like films and then commercials and stuff like that so um i have uh, you know computer date is first so what what can you tell us about computer date computer date was a really interesting one uh, originally it was titled love me in pieces uh, that's one uh, common thread throughout this movie is all, all the shorts were renamed for this movie. So I, I kind of changed their names for this particular release. And I wanted to give them bad names. Like, so, <laughs> you know, Love Me sounds kind of interesting. I'm like, computer date, make it really lame. You know, uh, we'll get to the doll later, but, you, you know, the doll was originally called Chester and Morty's uh, Grim, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting it. <laughs> Chester and Morty's <laughs> a Grim Return. And... You know, they all had these long titles, but Computer Date, the way that one started was uh, I'm, I'm good friends uh, with filmmaker Todd Sheets, uh, you know, Dreaming Purple Neon, Clown Nato, Goblin, Zombie Rampage, Zombie Bloodbath. And uh, he was producing a, an anthology called Sleepless Nights. And uh, we had just worked together on High 8 previously. And uh, Todd offered to give me a, a spot in Sleepless Nights. And the, the only problem with it was I had a month to write, shoot, edit, and turn in the movie. So I was kind of added late in the game. Uh, the movie was pretty much done at that time. So um, that wasn't a lot of time to make a, a, a movie. You know, one month, uh, normally I spend months on pre-production, you know, even just for a short, let alone, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, something bigger for, for this. So, um, I knew immediately, I'm like, I need a story that's minimal characters, minimal locations, but still is an interesting story and can kind of move along. And I usually like to do things that are kind of based off of, you know, I'll try to throw social commentary or I'll try to base it off of experiences and stuff like that. So, you know, Computer Date was pretty much, you know, about internet dating, <laughs> you know? And uh, I think many of us at this point have done internet dating. And oh yeah, oh yeah, it's, it's like I did a, it for a while. Yeah, yeah, I could relate, except for the very ending, I could relate, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's like a meat market. It's like everyone's kind of looking for the perfect mate and it's like you find someone and then next week there's someone better, you know? Like there's always, you know, this, this look for perfection. And, and I, I felt like, you know, all these dates I'd go on, they were like job interviews. And so I yeah. really wanted to inject that into the short. And my writer, I had a great writer who worked on this named Matt Hill, 
who uh, also wrote the tape for me, uh, which is my short and high eight. And so we worked together again on this and it was kind of a, a mix of my ideas and his ideas together. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, one month though, we had one month to make this thing. And I mean, it was all shot one bedroom apartment, you know, in my one bedroom apartment that I lived in um, pretty much, you know, uh, hanging up, uh, you know, a, a, a trick I, I like to share with people is, you know, if you don't have a lot of places to shoot, find ways to dress a set differently. So I maybe only had one room to shoot in, but I would hang different fabrics on the wall and do stuff like that to try to make it appear as though it's a completely different location, which I think we did pretty good at. I don't think people can tell it's shot in a one bedroom no. apartment. No, no. In fact, I, I, I didn't even realize that, uh, you know, until I did listen to the audio commentary. So I had no idea at all. So no, it was very well done. So, uh, yeah, so that was kind of our, our little thing on, you know, online dating. And I, I thought it was pretty fun. I, I had a few people tell me it's reminiscent of the film May, which I've never seen, actually. I, I should check it out sometime to see the similarities. But uh, that, that definitely wasn't intentional. Like I said, I had never seen it. I don't know if Matt Hill had or not. But, um, yeah, I thought it was a fun short. And I, I worked, uh, you know, with my normal kind of cast and crew, which is pretty much my friends, you know, uh, for the most part. I just bribe my friends with a free lunch and beer and whatever, you know, to come <laughs> and things with me. Here's a pizza, here's beer, you know, yeah. let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then the next one is, uh, cause uh, computer date was directed by you. The next one is cosmic desires. And that's uh, uh, Tim Ritter. Uh, can, what can you tell me about that? Yeah. So, um, Tim kind of, you know, when Tim got involved, you know, the, I, I kind of gave him the whole premise, the idea that, hey, we're going to do this thing kind of like USA off all night. I really want to kind of have a cheesy kind of feel to it. And so uh, I think Tim did a really good job at kind of, he came up with his own kind of concept for that, the cosmic desires. And it's pretty much about a woman who uh, is obsessed with aliens and, and wanting to mate with aliens without giving away the short yeah but, um, <laughs> in, in he, short he, that's what it is it's a short but in short that because yeah. Yeah. there's a and, lot more uh, story in there oh for sure for sure it's kind of this disgruntled couple as well you know this disgruntled couple and this this gal she's a, a lot more in, interested in intergalactic relations so to speak <laughs> than her husband but um and Tim, Tim did a great job. I mean, he, he produced it pretty fast. I mean, I, I think it was probably only like a few few months it took him to put that together. So he, he also did it really fast. And, and at the same time, like I said, he contributed some of those commercials and stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, his cast and crew were great. You know, Steve Gunn, I mean, you see him and he's in a bunch of Donald Farmer stuff as well as Tim stuff. And uh, Michelle McCobb, a.k.a. Shannon Stockton in there is the lead. She's always awesome. And she's also in a lot of Tim's stuff as well. So it, it was great. I mean, I grew up watching Tim's films as a kid, you know, renting Truth or Dare and Wicked Games, you know, and just like when I became friends with Tim, it was like, wow, it was like, you know, it, it'd be for someone else, you know, becoming friends with, I don't know, like Brad Pitt or something. <laughs> <laughs> To me, that was a big celebrity, you know, and, and, and to not only, you know, befriend him, but actually, you know, become good friends and work together now on so many different projects. I've probably done, probably worked on about 10 different movies with him at this point, doing like visual effects and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, Tim's a really good guy. When, when I kind of first got into this whole thing, um, he, he's one of those people that if you message him, like just do a private message, you will get back a book length message. Like he, you could just ask a simple, you could just say, hey, I, I really enjoyed Truth or Dare. And he will send you back, I mean, this message that's like that long to your itty bitty little compliment. And it's great that he does that because a lot of people would just write, thanks, you know, or something like that. And you're like, oh, oh, okay. I'm just trying to show my appreciation. I'm trying to be creepy. And he will actually, you know, message you back. And um, so I've had many good conversations with you know, with Tim and, and own a bunch of his movies. So and, and I got to be honest with you. And since you're the, the SOV guy, I hated shot on video movies when I was younger, hated them because they were shot on video. 
And I, if it didn't say Warner Brothers, if it didn't say Paramount, if it didn't say, you know, MGM, why would I watch them? What's the point? It looks like somebody made this in their backyard. And it wasn't until years later, and, and I don't remember what film it was, but all of a sudden I saw one movie and I wish I could remember what it was and it changed everything. And now I have an entire bookshelf of just these movies made by these guys, you know, the Donald Farmers and the Tim Ritters and, you know, and it's, and now it's, it's part of my life. And uh, so for people who do criticize, uh, you know, shot on video films, even if it's, you know, mini DV or whatever it might be, even, even films that are like super eight that are transferred over, you know, just back in the day, you give them a shot. I mean, definitely watch some because there's a ton out there that are great. And people put a lot of work into these. I mean, you know, it may not be Lord of the Rings, but it's, you know, it still takes a lot of time to do it. So it's, it's I missed out on a lot of that great stuff when it first came out. And, and I'm kind of disappointed in myself that I was so stubborn and, and not willing to watch them. So I'm really happy now that I do have this collection and I wouldn't give it up for anything. I'd rather be on the street than give up my my SOV collection. So <laughs> Sure, I, I totally get it. I mean, you know, it, it is one of those things where it's kind of always had this stigma against it. And it is the format, you know, I think if a lot of these movies were shot on film, you know, they'd be getting released by Arrow and Vinegar Syndrome and people would be talking about how much right. they love these movies, you know, but because they're shot on video, a lot of people just couldn't get past the look. What's cool is nowadays, you know, we're 30 40 years after, you know, the really the rise of shot on video movies. And so now I think newer generations are a little more open to the video look and all of that. And they don't mind. And they see these movies for what they are, which are these great creative movies full with tons of heart. You know, that's why I love shot on video movies. I always say SOV equals love because you got to love doing this shit to, to, to right. make a movie. Sure. Because these guys, these guys had, a lot of them had no expectations of even getting distribution. They were making movies because they were fans. They were horror fans first. And then they would make these horror movies. And some of them were lucky to get distribution. Some would even say unlucky to get distribution, depending on who you talk to. <laughs> oh, but, yeah. Um, you know, the, the, to me, these movies are, are such an important part of independent film in general you know just the the history of independent film and and uh, i think it's so great that people are slowly kind of opening their eyes and uh you know checking these movies out now with kind of fresh binoculars so to speak fresh specs and not judging them so much on the format that they were shot on right and and uh you're that's 100 percent correct it, it's you, people really need to give these things a chance because now that's what everything is shot on i mean you know, including a company is like Sony, they were shooting things on, you know, digital 4K for years before 4K even came out. So if you went to go see Spider-Man in the theater, you were actually watching a digital movie. You weren't watching something shot on film. And uh, so, yeah, people definitely need to give them a chance. And uh, yeah, I, I remember now the first film that, uh, that really got me into this was Easter Bunny Bloodbath. <laughs> that is, and, and that has now become my, my traditional Easter film to watch. So that, that's, uh, yeah, that, that one changed everything for me. And that was shot on VHS. So, um, yeah, so that, that was it. So give these things a chance, people. They're, they're definitely worth it. Um, the next film then would be The Doll, which uh, is directed by you and written by Tim Ritter. Yeah, so The Doll was originally... Uh, produced for uh, Brad Twiggs anthology Frames of Fear. I was approached to direct a short for that one. And uh, I had, at that point, I directed numerous shorts and I wanted to do something different. Like I said, normally I try to have like some kind of, uh, some kind of deeper meaning or substance to my shorts. And this time I was like, you know, I just want to make a shot on video kind of, you know, throwback to like Black Devil Doll from Hell, which is one of my favorite movies. <laughs> and so I pretty much, I, I'd always wanted a ventriloquist dummy. And so really was an excuse to buy a ventriloquist dummy, <laughs> and, uh, which was half of the budget for the movie. I mean, we, we shot that movie for about $600 and $300 of that was the dummy, um, you know? So, uh, but, but that one was a lot of fun. Um, it was, 
me and my friends and long story short it's about a uh, a ventriloquist <laughs> who uh isn't very good and he ends up killing himself and years later his uh granddaughter and her busty friends uh yeah. kind of go to his house and hold a seance and next thing you know the dolls uh come to life and is uh you know killing and maiming and, and doing sexual things and <laughs> like I, yes it does it does do sexual things that that is true so this this is this is probably my favorite out of out of the three films so it's just it's it's well written it's well shot the lighting is really good i think the acting is really good the the three girls play off of one another really well um especially you know with the dialogue going back and forth uh uh it looks kind of like a creep show type of episode. Uh, um, not the TV show, but like the Romero movie um, with its lighting and everything. Um, so this would probably be my favorite out of the three. Yeah, I, the lighting and stuff. So so I'm a big fan of uh, a filmmaker named Rick Sloan who made mm -hmm. Hobgoblin, Visitants, Blood Theater. And I'm actually, I'm good friends with Rick. I worked on Hobgoblins too, and I'm in the movie. And- um, Nice. I always loved his color palette, you know, growing up, I'd see his movies and it was always magenta and uh, magenta and green. And so, you know, I, I tried to inject that, that kind of became part of my style as a filmmaker almost immediately. I'm like colored lights. I love colored lights. And so yeah, it's very <laughs> creep show, very, you know, um, that, but I had a great, uh, a great assistant on that working with me. Uh, my, my, my best friend, John Hoden, who we kind of grew up, he was the first guy I ever knew who got a video camera and my first early shorts were actually made with him. And, but he, he's a uh, very good at lighting and a good camera guy. And so we kind of both gaffed the movie and shot the movie together and uh, you know, great cast and crew. I mean, it, it was a very small crew. I mean, it was pretty much me, John and a couple other friends kind of just helping out with things here and there. All the girls were, I mean, amazing. I mean, you know, the, these are my friends. These aren't actresses. I, I've seen some reviews, you know, that have put down the acting in the movie saying like, oh, no, the girls are really good in and they're really bad. And I'm like, well, they are my friends. For one. <laughs> they're not actors. Not, none of them are trained actresses. And, and all things considering, I mean, some of them, I mean, the, the actress, uh, Alice Rosenberg, who played Christy, I mean, she had to memorize some really long di dialogue yes. sequences. Yeah. And, and she did a great job. I mean, I know I wanted to be able to do that. <laughs> so, I, oh, yeah. you know, I, I was very proud of how that one came out. I, you know, the, the, the doll is probably one of my favorites uh, from the movie, for sure. Yeah, I don't know why people would, would criticize it. They, they, I mean, you're saying they're your friends, but I would guess that they're actresses, you know, and... Uh, because I think they do a really good job. I mean, it's it's a well-made short. And I don't know, I know people get a bug up their butt about this stuff and, and I don't get it. I mean, I don't understand. I mean, you're if, if you're seeing something, you know, about a killer doll, you know, it, it's okay. I mean, I, I could, if you look at something like Annabelle, I could pick out bad acting that's in Annabelle. Sure. Um, you know, those aren't great. Um, but these... Yeah, I don't get it. I don't understand. I, I kind of don't really even know what to say because I, I do read bad reviews for these type of things and I never understand it. And a lot of these people have never made movies themselves. So they don't, they don't know. I mean, they haven't even made something that's five minutes long, you know, much less, you know, a 20 minute short or even a feature. So, yeah, they, they should just be quiet and just, you know, I, I, I appreciate reviews if they're constructive, you know, but if, if you know, but if, if they're not constructive, then just forget about it, you know, so... My my one question with these three shorts, um, especially your two, since they were involved in other anthologies, were there any problems with those filmmakers or producers allowing you to use films in your anthology? Like, I mean, were they, or did you just ask and they said yes? Yeah, so... Um... I don't want to get too much into uh, past drama issues I had, but, but I did work on one movie in the past. I kind of mentioned it earlier that I was unable to obtain the rights to that film. And that was the, one of the first movies I made that got commercially released. And I learned a lesson from that one. I mean, I signed a really bad contract. I think it's the, the pitfall of being a first time filmmaker. You know, you're getting your movie out there. You're very excited. And I signed a terrible contract, which pretty much gave away all my, rights and uh 
I, I, I kind of learned after that, I said, I'm not signing a contract like that ever again. So all these other uh, projects that I contributed to, I was always very adamant that I want to control my rights, that I would give them permission to use my work, you know, free of charge in their films, but I would want to control my rights still. So, and I, I, I cleared it with all of the, the producers first before I did do this, you know, and that was also another reason I changed the names, you know, I was trying to kind of separate it and make it its own thing because I still mm. think people should check out those other movies. I mean, the, you know, like any other anthology, I mean, you know, there's so many great filmmakers involved with a lot of these that we worked on like Sleepless Nights and Frames of Fear that, you know, I, I still encourage people to go check out those, you know, as well. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I own uh, uh, two of those. I own uh, you know, Frames of Fear and I own High Eight. Um, uh, uh, I still need to get like sleepless nights. I know of them. I just haven't picked them up yet. So, I mean, it is so it within the contract itself, it was, you, you can use this film, but I still want to be able to put it into other things. And, uh, so there was paperwork done. You did sign releases or contracts or stuff for those. You just had the agreement to the other filmmakers. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and that's, you know, if I could give any piece of advice to up people who want to get into filmmaking is yes try to retain your rights if you can even me you know i run a, a distribution company i usually do limited licenses so i'll license a movie you know for a couple years or five years um some of the movies i've actually produced so i've produced a few different films like uh backyard gore and uh i was a teenage gore hound and some other movies and those you know, because I signed a bad contract, I try not to do that to the people who work with me. So same deal. Those guys can use their shorts in anything they want, you know, because it's their work. You know, I can't imagine. I mean, I can. I've been there. It really sucks <laughs> to make put all your blood, sweat and tears into something like the particular short. I, I, I don't want to name it by name that I'm referring to. But this particular short, I mean, this was a year of my life, you know, and. <clears throat> someone else controls it now i have no control over it I, and and long story short my movie was re-edited without my permission uh some things were changed without my permission and it really kind of rubbed me wrong and so i'm like i'm not going to make this mistake and with my company i'm like i'm not going to let other filmmakers fall into that trap i fell into so it's very important to me to you know because the, the, the SOV horror, it's all about getting this work out there. This is stuff that I think is really cool and people will like, and that's why I release it. And so I want to make sure that those guys aren't screwed either and still own their rights and still, you know, control th their work. So for upcoming filmmakers, that's the best thing I can tell you is, you know, don't don't sell your rights outright. If someone promises you back end, it's that's the biggest joke in filmmaking ever. If someone says, oh, yeah, you're getting 20 points, you know, on the back end you're never going to make one penny. You know? <laughs> uh, that, that one movie that I got ripped off on, I've still never seen a statement, you know, I've never seen anything. And, and this was made 10 years ago at this point, And it's been released on like five, six different formats at this point. So, I mean, you know, don't, don't fall for it. People control your rights. <laughs> yeah. I, I had, uh, you know, some good experiences and some bad experiences like, uh, you know, Brad Twig released, uh, Aximus one on Frames of Fear two, and then um, uh, Aximus two was released on another anthology that he brought out, and then um, Todd Jason Cook released Aximus through his company, and Aximus two through his company, and I kind of did the same agreement with them that that you're now doing, which is what I give you you is yours. You know, you you got I own the movie, but you can release it. I will give you special features that I will not put on any other DVD. So what Brad has is completely different from what Todd has. And so if you were to buy both DVDs, yeah, you're getting the same version of the film, but the special features are different. And they have no problem with that either because they're normally released about six months to a year apart from one another. And they have no problem with, oh, want to put it in the festival? You know, you could put your Axmas into a festival. Um, that's no problem. You want to make up posters? Fine, go ahead. So my relationship with them has been very good. And uh, except there is one guy who, without any paperwork at all on anything that I've done, claims to own 
um, except for the activist stuff, um, some short films that I did. And it's like, dude, there was no paperwork signed. There was nothing that you own these movies. And this has been a struggle ever since. And, um, and that's without paperwork. So it, it, it's, yeah, you got to really watch out who you deal with, talk to other filmmakers and, uh, you, you know, the people that, that we're mentioning are obviously good people. I'm not going to mention the person who, you know, who I'm having an issue with. Um, uh, plenty of people know who it is anyways. But it's, uh, yeah, you got to really watch out who it is. Because you do, you know, even if it's a, a 12 minute, you know, shot on digital film that maybe only costs you $500. It's still your life. You know, you put time and energy into it and money. It probably came out of your own paycheck. So yeah, you just got to be really careful with that type of stuff. So it, it's, yeah, so you, yeah, you're definitely, you know, except for that one person and my one person, it sounds like we've been pretty lucky on, on most stuff. So, you know, and I do know who you're talking about. So with, with your stuff. So, uh, um, so let's, okay. So we got the three, the three shorts done, which is great. So now in between these uh, are um, commercials, trailers, uh, uh, ads i mean there, there's so much stuff in between these things um that it's it's pretty amazing um like there's uh i mean i showed you this earlier but i'll show the people out there i mean i have three pages of notes here because there's so much in this dvd um so we're looking at uh um there's things like the 1900 ads uh, what what were those kind of like to do? The one nine hundred ads were a blast. So you know, the minute I figured out I wanted to do something like USA Off all night, the first thing I knew I needed was one nine hundred sex ads because anyone who would watch that, literally every commercial break was just filled with with sex ads. I mean, that's pretty much all they would pretty much play <laughs> were you know call me now ads. And so I knew I wanted to to do some cool ads like that. And uh, my good friend Raven Moon came down and, and she's, uh, she's a very uh, cool, sexy gal. And, and she was really game for it and, and doing these ads. And we shot all the, we shot all the ads in one day. It, it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was a very long day. I mean, and it was pretty much just me and her. So I was, you know, doing all the lighting and everything myself. And, uh, you know, but we had a blast doing it. I always love working with her. She's I first met her actually on computer date. She was uh, one of our makeup people on that. Hmm. And then quickly, you know, said, hey, I want to act. I want to be in movies. <laughs> you know, I'll, get naked. I'll do whatever you need. And, uh, you know, so, so she's great. And, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun making those. And it was cool writing them all, you know. Like, I, I tried to, like, literally kind of paraphrase old ones that I'd remembered, you know, like that whole... I am waiting and stuff. Like oh, that, they're they're know? perfect. They're they're right on because I remember those. Yeah, you know, we try to have fun with them too. You know, so some of them obviously we made them a little more silly. You know, like one nine hundred five 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 ball. You know, <laughs> what well, always game with me? <laughs> yeah, well, and you got pink. You you got the 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 commercial for pink. <laughs> So I'm not sure what that's a what pink would be, but uh, <laughs> I think I think that uh, we can figure it out. So yeah, they're they're pretty right on, and they're sprinkled throughout the whole thing. So which is, and she does a great job. I mean, she's right on to, you know, the the women that used to do these things. So because that's the thing, you had to have the the hot chick, you know, to to sell the ad to get the the guy like me to to call it up and you know spend five hundred dollars. So. Yeah, you know, it's a she does a great job. And then you have um, I'm just gonna mention a couple of these. Uh uh well, okay, so there's the the cannibal vampire call girl hookers from outer space, parts one, two, and three. Uh, what can you tell us about those? So um cannibal vampire call girl hookers from outer space part one was I made that in, I think that was around 2000 or so. I was supposed to be shooting actually a scene for a movie that I was producing at the time that ended up falling apart. And an actor who was supposed to show up did not show up to shoot. And so I was like, oh crap, I, I prepped this dick bite scene. That, that was what we we're gonna <laughs> be 
you should be able to dick biting. And so I prepped this scene and I was like, well, what am I going to do now? I don't want to just not do something tonight. So I called up some of my girlfriends. I was like, Hey, want to come over and, you know, shoot something. And I came up with the idea, like in like two seconds, I was just like, Can I play a part? <laughs> let's do it. You know, <laughs> and so, you know, we sh uh, we shot that on high eight. I remember that was shot on a high eight, uh, old high eight camera I had that had a dead pixel and everything. And, uh, and uh, you know, it was just crap I had in my fridge. <laughs> you know, <it> was a <laughs> and actually, there's a funny story about, about that. So, you know, uh, w w when the guy is getting the blowjob from from the cannibal hooker, you know, we actually do show it. And it, it, we have this red lighting, you know, I had a one big red bulb, I think that we used for it. And it looks kind of real under the red bulb. And I remember <laughs> I sent it to the filmmaker who was making horror porn in the early 2000s, who was also from San Diego, where I'm located. And so I sent him this thing and I was like, hey, I'd love to work with you sometime. This is what I'm doing. And he saw it and he's like, oh, this is great. Yeah, let's do something sometime. And then I mentioned that it wasn't real, that, you know, that the penis wasn't real. And then he didn't want to work with me anymore. Oh, <laughs> like, <that was laughs> oops. Kind of, <laughs> kind of the opposite of what you would think. And, you know, it's, yeah. and, 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 and I got to admit, I, I'm guilty. I did rewind it going, did, was that real? And I, and I did rewind it and go, I don't think that's real, but it looks real. I mean, it, it, I had to rewind it. So, you know, I was fooled. So, um, and, and I can, I'm, well, looking at the title of this, this is, of course, another one of your long titles, is I'm kind of picturing in my head how it came up. Like, I want to do a, what if they were vampire called girls? Well, what if they were also cannibals? Oh, and what if they were hookers? Nah, it's still not there. And they're from outer space. Now we got the film in the title. And it's just because well, that you, all can't come from just one like brain, you know, thought, you know, it had to be, you know, something of, of this goes to this goes to that. It, it kind of actually came together pretty organically. And, and, you know, I wanted to make sure that there was that stupid redundancy in the title. <laughs> That's why it's called girl hookers. I mean, it's kind of the same thing. But, uh, you know, I, I kind of liked having up. So, so around as some people, like I said, you know, we, we've got some interest. People seem to really like it. This is in the late nineties, early two thousands. And, and so I immediately started working on a sequel trailer and the sequel trailer was originally going to be a way to fund a feature. So I wanted to, you know, kind of use that old evil dead trick, you know, make a trailer, try to show it to some investors and see, you know, if you can raise some money to make a feature version and so that's what part two was and part two though was actually the first thing i ever did that had nudity in it so that was the first time but we didn't finish it because my ad got drunk and <laughs> he was supposed to be giving drinks to some of the girls nudity, and he was slipping shots you know, <laughs> and so my AD <laughs> ended up shit face drunk. We couldn't finish the shoot. And uh, so unfortunately, like what we had shot is pretty much, you know, what we had. And then the third one, well, actually, I guess to back up just a little more, we did, I did attempt to make a feature at one point and I was in pre-production for better half of a year. Uh, it was my call was involved in it and everything and uh something bad happened in my personal life and unfortunately that kind of fell by the way for grind exploitation i was asked to do a trailer for that i'm like i'm doing cannibal hookers three and this time i thought how how much gore and nudity can i put in one trailer you know? <laughs> and that was the thought with part three and uh i mean looking back at part three i mean and anyone who watches it will see there's more nudity and blood in that trailer than a lot of movies you watch today. Oh yeah, there, there's and, a lot. Um, yeah, we we 
I probably, that took us about three or four months to make that. I mean, it was oh. many different weekends shooting. There was, a, I know there for a fact, there was over a hundred different camera setups. Um, you know, there's probably at least 30 to 40 gore effects, a ton of nude scenes, you know, and uh, one of my favorite moments from, from that one is actually the same actress who played the 1900 actress. And um, I, me and my, my, my DP were, were uh, big fans of the blood sucking freaks, you know, the Joel M. Reed movie. And one of the scenes that always stuck ass to that in, in that movie was a scene where uh, really cool. And we're like, why don't we, I want to do that, but I want to make it even grosser. I want to use real guts. I want to use beef guts. So I bought about like five or six pounds of beef guts and, uh, my, my good friend Raven Moon, who played that part, God bless her. She uh, she's a vegetarian, so she doesn't eat meat, oh. <laughs> and she had to rub these beef guts all over her breasts. And I mean, these were real beef guts. They still had stuff juice in them and stuff like that. Oh and, wow! Uh, I have some pretty hilarious outtake of, <laughs> of that. Maybe we'll put out at some point, but. Uh, yeah, Cannibal Hookers three was was a, was a blast. I mean, uh, ultimately though, I almost wish I would have made a full movie because pretty much I had enough content to make a full movie minus the dialogue. You know, there was so much in it. So uh, in retrospect, I wish I would have shot some dialogue scenes and just made a full film out of it. You know. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely with a title like that and with the footage that you have. Um, it definitely seems like you could do a, uh, a, a like a brand new feature or uh, kind of do like an extended short on it because um, it uh, I know definitely people would want to see it. I mean, there's these types of films out there now that uh, people really like. And uh, so, are, I mean, what are your thoughts on doing something like this? I mean, there's a few shorts in here that you could easily make a feature out of. Yeah, so, so what's actually funny is I kind of mentioned earlier, part of the genesis of this project was putting together another project that I had my friend host and as the Zombarella character. And that project was actually the Cannibal Vampire Cargo Hookers from Outer Space extra footage. So I kind of cut together this thing I called the Ghoul Girls, which was oh. all unused footage from that and turning it more into a narrative. So actually editing full on scenes and I cut together about this hour program that featured all, and maybe maybe someday I'll release it. I don't know. I don't know if there's a lot of interest in it. I mean, a lot of it is just, you know, nudity and, and just gore, you know, but, uh, you know, if, if, if enough people bother me, maybe, maybe I'll put it out at some point. Well, I think nudity and gore are the magic words there. So <laughs> I think you got your base right there. So. You know, it's got a good title, too. I would be interested in seeing it, you know, you know, especially after, you know, seeing the trailers for these. So um, now what about things like uh, a damn fine cop and the uh, the backwoods snuff party massacre? What, what about those two? Yeah, so um, most of the little commercial like uh, TV spots is kind of what we were thinking of them as or little trailers. Most of those were actually repurposed footage from old shorts and stuff like that. So uh, Backwood Snuff Party Massacre was a short uh, I had made called a Flint Springs Machete Massacre that was just recut into a, uh, you know, a short little kind of spot. Um, I mean, it's a terrible movie. It's one of my earliest movies that I made. It was really bad. I actually played a role in it. I did some acting and you know, I used to act in some of those early movies and I'm not much of an actor. So <laughs> <laughs> I cut myself out of the version that's in Zombarella. But uh, same thing with Damn Fine Cop. That was actually, I think that was a school project I did. We had to write like a screenplay or something, a short screenplay. And I wrote this whole little cop drama thing because I just, you know, had, had a gun sitting around. <laughs> You know, <laughs> it's just kind of little ideas came together and, and that was called something else. I, I think it was, uh, I forget the original title of that. Uh, it was named after the serial killer. It was all about this interview with this serial killer guy. And so, you know, I knew I wanted to have like some TV shows. I didn't want it to just be movies. So I was like, hey, let's do a damn fine pop. You know, that could be kind of cheesy and fun. So that's kind of what we did with that. But yeah, lo lots of the, that stuff was all just repurposed uh, stuff that had been shot over the years. And then um, <clears throat> now two uh, Tim Ritter uh, shorts that are in this, Creep 2 and Crocogator. 
And now Creep 2, I own Creep, but Creep 2 was never made, correct? It's just the, the trailer. Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, Tim, Tim just kind of put that together. He had shot some new footage, and I believe he used some outtakes from Creep that weren't used in the movie. And I think there's even a shot from the like, killing spree kind of thrown in there. And uh, yeah, it's just kind of one of the fake trailers he put together, together for it. And I thought it was kind of fun, you know. It was, obviously, to me, it was really cool because it's like now I got Joel D. Winecoop in my movie. <laughs> yes. I'm a huge fan of Joel. And, and I mean, he's like the king of the bees. And I love Joel. He's <laughs> And so it's really cool getting him in the movie that way. And I'm a huge fan of Creep, so kind of cool to have Creep too. And Crocagator, I thought was great. You know, uh, for people who don't know Tim personally, Tim's, I think, I'm pretty sure his favorite movie is Jaws. I mean, he loves Jaws. He's like really big on Jaws. And so that kind of gave him an opportunity to kind of make this Jaws type trailer, you know, with Crocagator. And he just recently made a movie called Sharks of the Corn. So he finally made his yes. real his real shark movie recently, which is really cool. And uh, yeah, I think those trailers are a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I like Crocker Gator. I, I like how the, the the camera sits on like the fake head as it's going through the water. And, and the head really is just like, you know, it's, just, it's, it's, it's so low budget, but awesome looking at the same time. So it's-, yeah, it's That's from, that's from uh, one of his movies called uh, Alien Agenda. I, I, I don't remember which one there's like three or four of those okay so next would be uh what about the drug psas that you have on here can you tell me about those oh for sure so yeah i mean another staple of 80s and 90s television was uh, all the drug psas you would always see and i had shot um once again i was repurposing a lot of old footage so um the crack is whack one was actually from a music video I had shot years ago, um, which was kind of based on this uh, horror movie idea I had called The Rot, which is a kind of this superhero type, uh, this, this girl who thinks she's going to clean up society type thing, but she's really just fucked up on drugs. So the smoking crack scene was from that. And one of the guys who I went to school with actually ran a shop. And so that, that was a real crack pipe that he got from his head. <laughs> but she was just, she just had, a, she was taking a puffs of a cigarette, you know, and, and that was the smoke. So <laughs> the heroin one, the, I forget what that one's called, but there's one where a guy's kind of shooting up heroin. And that was actually based on the same source material. So that was an earlier version of that kind of music video short. Uh, that never got finished. Um, and uh, yeah, I remember for that, we actually made a fake needle. So we made a fake hypodermic needle uh, out of a real one. I got a, like a, a real pin and put a pin on there and cut off it, dulled the edge so it could be pushed in. But I wanted, I still wanted the shot of the needle going in the arm. So <laughs> I really, I had to bribe my friend. I'm like, come on, just put the needle in your arm. <laughs> Let me get that shot. It's going to look really cool. <laughs> and uh, thankfully, thankfully, I was able to convince him to do it. And I thought it was a pretty cool shot. You know, as, as a, th those were fun projects to work on. Yeah, they were fun. And uh, what about uh, Earl Action Hero and um, Hippie's Revenge? Yeah, so those both star my, my good buddy Errol, who was also that AD who got drunk on Cannibal Hookers, Vampire Hookers 2. Um, anyone who knows my buddy Errol knows he's kind of, the best way I can describe Errol is uh, he, he worships Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> um, he, he's the furthest thing from an action hero in the world and when i was learning compositing so i, I went to a college and studied digital video filmmaking and uh, web design and that's what i have my degree in and um when i was doing all that i was learning compositing and i, I self-taught myself compositing and eventually ended up working in the visual effects industry working you know work on a lot of movies doing that but um, a lot of that Errol Action Zero stuff was just tests that I shot because at the time Errol was living with me. And so we would just shoot these little effects test footage. And so that was literally just shots of different effects text, test footage that I 
done and just thrown together to make this story. And to us, it was real funny because Errol's the type of guy who, you know, he's not going to get up and run. <laughs> he's not going to get up and do anything. And that's what we, what we called him action zero. You know, we called him action zero because I thought that was funny. And so he also starred in uh, Hippie's Revenge, which was just another short, uh, short fake trailer that was actually made as a fake trailer um, around the same time as another one that's also in the movie and stars Errol called uh, Night of the Living Bums. And those were just real short, like just concepts I came up with. And I was like, hey, let's just shoot these. I think both of them were shot in like an hour or two and, you know, and edited and yeah, so that's kind of me just getting my feet wet in those early days of, you know, learning how to edit and all that, you know. Okay. And then uh, we have uh, House of Hose, uh, which um, has, uh, which is uh, Tim Ritter, directed by Tim Ritter, and has a little cameo by uh, one uh, Donald Farmer in it. What about that one? Yeah, so uh, I was really stoked when Tim did that one because, like you said, Donald's in there and uh, with some footage from Doing Top No Donut 2. And I really <laughs> liked uh, the. You know, if anyone's seen that, uh, Donald Farmer kind of plays this crazy uh, cop who uh, kidnaps the mayor's daughter. And it, it, the shot in the trailer uh, it, in the Holly's House of Hose is, uh, you know, now offering discounts for our law enforcement, you know, which I thought was really <laughs> funny. Uh, that one was a little long, you know, it was a little longer than a lot of the other tra trailers and kind of things in there. Um, you know, I almost wanted to break it up, but I, you know, I, I felt so fortunate for everything Tim had done for us. And, and so I didn't really want to break that up. But uh, that kind of, when we did the sequel, Natasha Knight's Boudoir of Blood, that was kind of one of the lessons I learned was I, I want to make these commercial breaks shorter a little more frequent, a little shorter, and don't have any ads that run over 30 seconds. Because I think it, once they run about over 30 seconds, that's when you know people start to lose the attention span, I think. But I still really like the House of Hose. I thought it was really funny. <laughs> and he used to take footage uh, from Creep in there as well, which is cool. Oh, nice. <laughs> and so what is um, <clears throat> I-U-S-N promo? What, what is that? Yeah, so, you know, when, when I came up with the idea of making it this lost satellite cable TV network, because it had to be something that could show blood and nudity, so it couldn't be like a regular UHF station, and so I had to create a station, and so I was just trying to think of call letters, you know, all these stations have, you know, WGHT or whatever, you know, they all have different call letters, so I just came up with IUSN, which was inter, uh, Independent Underground Satellite Network. So okay. like it's this fake satellite, you know, pirate <laughs> kind of satellite network type thing. So and and that was once again that that was just comprised of a bunch of uh, test footage shots that I'd done, uh, you know, when I was learning compositing. So a lot of kind of early compositing tricks and stuff like that. And then um, uh, Lucky Chucky Beer. What about Lucky Chucky Beer? That was made uh, actually. For college, it was the college project. We were supposed to make, I think it was a Bud Light beer commercial. And so I'd shot this beer commercial, and originally that was shot, uh, the, the music scoring it was Warren's Cherry Pie, you know, when the, when the hot chick is kind of walking towards him. And oh, the yeah. actor in that um, who played Lucky Chucky is a good buddy of mine, Travis Hecker. We actually went to college together and stuff. And and uh, he, uh, he played the character Chuck in, in the short that's before it, um, Computer Date. So it's kind yes. of a take off of that. What I ended up doing was I just changed the name of the beer to Lucky Chucky. And I, you know, I did some compositing to change the name of the beer and kind of re-brought up that joke. Because it's a joke in the movie, too. There's this whole <clears throat> Lucky Chucky, you know, kind of fucky and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah because that that's his profile name isn't it for like the the, the dating website is lucky chucky yeah, yeah lucky chucky. <laughs> so it's good to see that he didn't die in vain because he had a beer named after him so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then now mondo bizarro um that's a small part of a larger episode which is on the or at least one episode that's on the dvd 
Yeah, so Mono Bizarro was a public access uh, television show that I produced in the early 2000s, like around 2001, 2002. Um, I had just discovered public domain, you know, the, the, <laughs> the joys of public domain. And I I'd found all these cool, you know, old uh, educational shorts. And I grew up watching stuff like Mystery Science Theater and stuff like that. So I was always a big fan of these types of uh, shorts, especially drug and sex education ones, you know. A lot of them, they're so old that a lot of the information isn't correct. And so, you know, because they're dated now. Oh, yeah. And so they're unintentionally hilarious. A lot of these things are really funny. And so uh, me and my buddies produced this show for cable access television out here in San Diego. And uh, we ended up doing uh, six episodes. So we did six episodes. Uh, we had a few more produced that we never shot the host segments for, but we did make them. And uh, th that was a real fun uh, experience working on Mondo Bizarro. And um, so once again, I, I wanted to have kind of like TV shows. So I thought, hey, just m cut a little promo for Mondo Bizarro, you know? So I just kind of got some of the footage, repurposed it to make this little promo for this television show and decided, hey, I should add, you know, an episode to the disc and people might want to check it out. And that As Boys Grow is one of my favorite episodes. We that is creepy. Episodes. That is that is such the, I mean, I, I can't imagine being one of those kids going home at that time and the dad going, so son, what did you do today? Well, the coach taught me this. I mean, it would just be today that coach would just be canceled. But uh, I mean, who knows? Back then, maybe it was acceptable. But uh, uh, yeah, it was. It's it's hilariously creepy. So you know, yeah, and, and he's got. Was... <laughs> well, yeah, and and no... was... <laughs> yeah, he's so just serious about it, and, and and this is you know straightforward how things work. And the kids never really make fun of one another too. You know, when they're talking about wet dreams, and you know, nobody's making fun of each other, which is. Which is weird. You think they'd be make you know bullying each other, but I guess you know for this they they weren't. And uh, but you could get those episodes right. There's a DVD available with with the Mondo Bizarro episodes. Yeah, six, six bucks at sobhorror.com. Six bucks for six episodes. I mean, it's a pretty good deal. And uh, you know, I don't really make any money off of it. It's just one of those things I put out because I figured, hey, maybe people are interested in checking it out. You know, it's kind of got a little bit of a cult following in our group of friends. You know, all my friends always love Mondo Bizarro and still tell me, oh, I just watched Mondo again the other day, you know. So it's kind of one of those things that we did that that seems to be pretty popular in our circle. And then um, after that is uh, Night of Living Bums, which you briefly talked about. Uh, anything more on that one? Uh, just that one was fun. I mean, uh, the, the, part of that was, uh, you know, uh, getting one of those, uh, we had got one of those mannequin heads that they use in the beauty schools. At the time I was dating a girl who uh, worked in, worked at a beauty school. And so I got a bunch of these heads and we, you know, made this rig so we could stab it in the eye. <laughs> and we didn't have good vampire fangs at the time. So the guy who's the killer bum, you, you can barely see it, but he's wearing like those cheap 25 cent vampire things. But because he's running towards the camera, you can't really tell. <laughs> so, you know, a little happy accident sometimes. And then now this is one I would like to see as a feature, Nuns with Guns. <laughs> yeah, that was just another one. I came up with the title. I had a shotgun. I said, come on guys, <laughs> let's just shoot this. And, and that one's actually real funny. So that was one that we had shot and I was gonna edit. I was actually gonna shoot more and we never shot more of it. And it just kind of sat unedited for years. And when I started working on this project, I was going through all my old DV tapes and, and archiving them and all my I-8 tapes and archiving them. And uh, I came across the nuns with guns and I said, oh shit, I, we, I forgot all about this. We never even edited it. So that was the first time it ever got edited and, and thrown in, in, in this uh, program. So yeah, that one was fun. Yeah, it has a, a, a grindhouse feel to it. So yeah. Yeah, that one I liked. And then uh, 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 Snuff Files 3. And then I'll discuss the next one because there's two parts on that one that I want to talk about. So uh, what's up with uh, Snuff Files 3? Snuff House 3, so when I was first learning Final Cut Pro, um, I realized that, you know, 
there's like garbage mats and stuff like that. I was like, wow, you can actually do compositing on your own. And, and literally I had no one teaching me this. I literally just kind of realized this, like, wow, I can get this footage and this footage and cut it and put it together and, you know, use these garbage mats to mat things in and mat things out. So I literally just, it, it was me learning how to do compositing and at that, not even in a compositing program, all those effects were done in Final Cut Pro, believe it or yeah. not. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and, and, and so it's all just really bad kind of compositing stuff that I did when I was first learning compositing and the title, I think, honestly, I, I think I stole the title from a, a Japanese, I had this bootleg true deaf movie, I think it was called Deaf Files 3. So I just, I changed mine to <laughs> Snuff Files 3. <laughs> That's then I discovered that I did a series of movies called Snuff Files. So I, I don't know if uh, you know when that when that first was made. If we were the first one to make a Snuff Files, or if someone else was, but it's kind of an interesting thing I found out recently. Huh. <laughs> so now next is <clears throat> tits, and then at the very end. You, you do uh, um, kind of uh, promise us or hint at the sequel, Ass. So, um, so will we ever see a double feature of Tits and Ass? <laughs> you know, if enough people email me and ask for it, I, th I think we can make that feature. <laughs> um, that was another one. It was just like, hey, I got all this nudity footage, you know, that I've shot over the years and and I thought it was literally just a joke. I literally edited it one day just for fun and, and just thought it was funny, you know, tits. And, and of course, the sequel to tits has to be ass. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> what, what would part three be if you had to make a part three? Because people seem to have feet. People have a fetish for feet. People have a fetish for all sorts of things. I mean, you could do a whole series <laughs> of these probably with all the different fetishes people have. So Thighs. <laughs> Maybe thighs. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then yeah. after that, uh, we got a typeface. Uh, what's typeface like? So typeface was an early short film I made. It was my first real, real short film. To me, that's what I consider my first real short. I'd made many shorts before that, but typeface was the first short I made that was like a half an hour long. Um, you know, we treated it like a real movie, you know, it was the first time where it wasn't just me and a couple friends dicking around. It was really like, hey, I have a script, I have a concept, I have an idea, let's get together and let's make this movie. And it really started because uh, my grandfather had passed away and he owned some houses. And so I had an empty house I could shoot in. And so I'm like, okay, what can I do with an empty house? And I came up with this idea, this minimalist writer, you know, who uh, pretty much has a typewriter that if he feeds it blood, it helps him write his book. It's very inspired by the works of Roger Corman. You know, the, the movie itself has a lot of nods to Roger Corman stuff like Bucket of Blood and Little Shop of Horrors. And that's why it's in black and white as well. I was going for that kind of Roger Corman type feel. And um, that one was a lot of fun. It, it, um, it, it's one of those movies that, you know, I've, I've, re-edited multiple times over the years there's been so many different cuts of that movie and uh there was a good response to it in in the zombarella movie a lot of people kept asking me about that one hey what's up with typeface what's up with typeface so in the sequel in natasha 90's boudoir of blood i actually included typeface as one of the shorts in that so people oh, can okay. see that full <clears throat> in natasha 90's boudoir of blood Oh, nice, nice. I, I own that, but I have not had a chance to watch it yet. Because um, there was so much on this DVD, I just didn't have a chance to check it out. Um, it's really like getting like a two disc DVD in one. Um, now we got coming up, we got a, 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 a Tim Ritter. Um, so we got a Vampire Movie Starlet. What about that one? Um, from what I know, a lot of that is from some uh, kind of uh, lost projects that he was working on and with, with some new footage. Um, there was this whole series of Sub Rosa releases, or I think at the time they were still called Salt City back then, that were these kind of uh, fetishy, nudie type movies, usually focused on vampires and stuff like that. 
And so I think a lot of the footage came from some one of the, I'm, I'm trying to remember what it was called. I think it was called Slaughtered Starlets, I believe is what it was called. And I think a lot of it came from that and Tim just kind of repurposed it to make this kind of vampire kind of softcore type uh, trailer, which anyone who's fans of shot on video, like is familiar with all the softcore lesbian vampire movies. <laughs> It's it's nice that that you guys could take like, you know, footage from abandoned films or lost films or, you know, just little test things that you did and put them into one film because it, it it almost seems like a lot of these were made for this film. You know, that was the plan. And so but you could tell by actually watching them that some people look younger, some people look older. And, and uh, but it's nice to get it all out there. I mean, then you don't have to you know, kind of worry about it. And, and it's you know, it doesn't become like a waste, you know, you know, oh, wow, I spent, you know, three hundred dollars on this and nothing ever happened to it. Well, now it's in the film. So uh, the next one would be we Willie Winky. There, there's a name for you. Uh, what about that? So that was actually made on a bet. I had a friend, I, I was I was living in this uh, kind of crazy punk house and, and I had a friend who was, who was staying on the couch and he was like, he's like, you can make a movie out of anything. You know, he'd seen some of my stuff and he's like, he, and I was like, yeah, I can make a movie off of anything. I'm like, give me a title, I will make that movie. And so he says, we willy winky. <laughs> and uh, I was like, we willy winky. Okay, what okay. can you do? What rhymes will you do? dinky and so i came up literally with the with with the trailer voiceover immediately which is we willy winky played what is dinky and all the kids they <laughs> laughed <laughs> they locked him up and now he's out he'll cut your dick in half <laughs> and, uh, and, children's and rhyme did, yeah obviously we did the dick thing because i i, I had the the fake penis prosthetics already and uh the, the one really cool shot that I'm really proud of in that one is there's a shot where Winky's in the jail and you see the jail cell close. And the, that was actually the gate of my front yard. So we had an actor sitting on the ground and a couple of friends behind the actor holding up a piece of, uh, of uh, sorry, a wall, you know, like a piece of wall, like a, a rock sheet, you know, uh, but behind the actor and then we just closed the gate and it kind of looked like a jail cell and so that was kind of one of those examples of uh using what you got to kind of make something bigger right <laughs> yeah it, it it uh um for the way that you described it in the audio commentary it kind of reminded me of uh there's a, a really old uh making of the terminator uh people could see it on youtube and it uh, i guess it came out probably around the time the terminator came out maybe like 1984 somewhere in there and uh, the scene where Schwarzenegger punches through the car window um, as they're driving down through an alleyway, the car is sitting there. It's the brick wall that's moving because they figured that's the only way they could get the shot. So they just went out and bought fake brick wall and then just put it on rollers and just, OK, you know, action cut. And then they just rolled it back. And, and so it, it reminded me of that when you were describing it in, the, you know, in your audio commentary that yeah you go out you buy fake wall or plywood or whatever it is and you have a wall and and yeah then it looks like she's you know that she's in jail like she's behind bars so there's e even lower budget stuff and bigger budget stuff like terminator there, there's always these and of course cameron being from the roger corman camp he is thinking of these things that you have to you know how do we do this so yeah it's very easy to get that type of stuff all you got to do is have a, a little bit of a, a imagination so um, so the one thing that we haven't talked about are the host segments. Uh, um, and so how, how did that all come together? How, how did you, you know, get, uh, you know, Zombrella and how did you get all that stuff going? Yeah. So, uh, Zombrella and me, or the actress who played her, my friend, Amy, um, we go way back. We've played in numerous bands together over the years. You know, I've, I've played in a lot of different punk rock and noise rock bands out here in San Diego. And uh, me and her had worked tons of different bands together. I mean, a billion different bands over the years. And um, so uh, it was kind of just one of those things, you know, I, I, I was re-editing together this, this Cannibal Vampire Call Girls Hookers from Outer Space footage. And I 
said, hey, we could do these host segments. Maybe that could be fun. <clears throat> and she has this really, I mean, as you see in the movie, she has a kind of like this gothy type look, you know, that I thought really lended itself to a horror hostess, you know, that she kind of has just the right look for that. And uh, and obviously she's very busty as well. So, yes. you know, um, would have no problems bouncing. Around <laughs> There's a lot of bouncing in this. Yes. <laughs> Good for them. <laughs> And it's funny because she's actually a pretty modest girl. She's not she's not the type of girl who is really overtly sexual or anything like this. So she really did jump out of her wheelhouse to do these host segments. And uh, you know, one of her requirements was she had to, you know, get drunk to to shoot them. So <laughs> and normally normally I don't I don't like to drink or anything when I'm shooting anything. I try to be completely, you know, straight edge until the after party. And, um, but in this case, me and her are drinking buddies. So, you know, I had to drink with her, which was a challenge for me as a director, because here I am, I'm getting intoxicated. She's getting intoxicated. I'm trying to make sure she knows the lines, the eye line is right, <laughs> the lighting is right. I'm doing everything and now I'm kind of drunk. And so it was definitely challenging. And we, we shot all the host segments the first time when the movie, the early rough cut had that short that we couldn't put in the movie. So we had to actually go back and reshoot the host segments once Tim got involved and we added in the Tim Ritter stuff. So that was actually the second time that we shot the host segments. But uh, yeah, she did a really good job and it was really fun kind of working with her on that. And uh, yeah, I thought it came out pretty cool. Yeah, she looks like she's having fun. So yeah, okay. And then, of course, my qu one question is, who is Fred Olin Wood? So that's me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so <a> <laughs> surprise. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's a mix of Fred Olin Ray and Ed Wood, two of my favorite film directors. And I, I wanted to, I knew that I wanted the movie within the movie to be a fake movie. So I didn't want to have any real names on it. I didn't want to have, you know, I wanted all the names to be fake and none of that stuff to be revealed until the very end. So, you know, I, I just came up with the name Fred Oldenwood, which I thought was a lot of fun. And it's kind of funny because Fred Olin Ray got wind of it uh, probably a year or so after the movie came out and he, he goes, what, you're not going to send me a copy? <laughs> <So> <laughs> I just, I, <laughs> but it, it's kind of funny because the first movie credit I ever got was in a Fred Olin Ray movie. He had uh, he was making all these bikini movies for Cinemax and Showtime, I think. This was the early 2000s. And he, he made this movie, uh, I think at the time it was called The Good, The Bad, and The Beautiful. And they needed to come up with a new title with the word bikini in it. Uh, for, for Cable. Cable wanted a new title for it. So we had this contest, come up with the name for my movie and I'll give you associate producer credit. Mm -hmm. And so I came up with the title Bikini Roundup and that was my first movie credit I ever got. <laughs> but what about it is my card, there's literally a butt on my title card. So like on that scene <laughs> in the movie, my name is right next to an ass, which I just thought nice. was hilarious. <laughs> Very <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I like uh, I like Fred. He's he's I've had a couple conversations with him and, and he seems like a nice guy. So, you know, very knowledgeable, very too. Cool. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, so knowledgeable about, you know, drive in cinema and, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. stuff. Yeah. Well, and, and he did, uh, along with uh, Jim Wynorski, probably my all time favorite audio commentary. And that was for uh, Dinosaur Island. By far, oh, nice. one of the best audio commentaries I've ever heard. It was absolutely hilarious, and well, it's so uh, great that we got that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, <laughs> it, it's a you know. Of course, we get Carnosaur in it, and and the the bevy of B movie queens that were in it at the time. So, like all those scream queens. Um, so then, um, so one other question that I have is. Uh, so since this film is kind of a combination of stuff you've done from the beginning up to that moment, that present day, what was like filming and editing equipment and all that? How, I mean, how has that really affected like your filmmaking now? Like what has really changed? How has it helped you? 
Well, I mean, gosh, in the early days when I first started shooting on high eight, I mean, we had to edit with VCRs. I mean, we, we didn't have any money, you know, we didn't have any access to editing equipment. So it was literally two VCRs, you know, and uh, it was terrible. <laughs> but a lot of my early short films are not in this movie and i mean it's 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 on purpose because they're so bad i can't even get any usable footage from them to put them in this thing oh wow and, <laughs> well you know everyone starts off you know kind of uh you don't know what you're doing you know when i first started off i was very into like trauma and stuff like that a lot and so I really have that real crass kind of sense of humor in a lot of that early stuff I did. Very into early John Waters. So it's very crass, very kind of disgusting type humor, uh, which I'm not as big into these days. And um, so a lot of that stuff was just really stupid and kind of juvenile and not really done good. But I was kind of lucky and early on, like I, I started editing on Premiere Pro 1. So the first... Premiere Pro, my friend's dad worked for Adobe at the time. Premiere Pro 1 had just come out. And before that, I was using Windows Movie Maker. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've, I've used that, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I, I mean, I don't know if you remember Windows Movie Maker back then, you could only have one audio track. That's it. Like, so right. if you wanted to put a sound effect, you had to cut out any other audio to put in that sound effect, you know? So, like, in Typeface, there's a gunshot everything gets quiet for the gunshot originally because it was limited <laughs> by the software. But I got lucky and I, I got my hands on Premiere Pro 1.0 and, uh, you know, started learning nonlinear editing and pretty much taught myself how to do it. You know, I think I bought a book and, and just started teaching myself how to do it. And like a lot of people, I eventually moved to Final Cut Pro and uh, used that for quite a few years. But then I'm, I'm back to Premiere Pro, uh, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of the Mac software, honestly. They ruined Final Cut Pro when they hit 10. And, uh, but it's amazing what the technology is now. I mean, it's so amazing. I mean, yeah, you know, it's so much easier. You know, a lot of people judge, we were talking earlier about just shot on video horror movies in general and how people judge them because of the look and stuff like that. Well, another thing people judge them on is a lot of times is the editing and stuff like that as well. And, you know, the editing the technology has gotten so much better. Like people growing up today with the modern editing and even the compositing systems. I mean, now to, to composite someone out of a shot, it's as easy just like kind of coloring them <laughs> in and they're gone, you know? Like back in the day, we didn't have to roto, rotoscope and go frame by frame and paint people out. I mean, I worked in visual effects and, and, and trust me, painting people out of a shot frame by frame is freaking tedious, you know? Right. And, uh, so the technology has just improved so much and it's so great. And I'm glad it's kind of leveled the playing field for amateurs to get into movie making and even get their movies made and out there so other people can see them. Um, but at the same time, it also, it's good and it's bad in my opinion. It's good because more people can follow their dreams and kind of get into this stuff and try it. But that also is also why it's bad because you know, back in the day in the 80s and the 90s, every year, maybe, what, 30 to 40 horror movies would come out. Now, every month, we have like 200. Plus <laughs> That's true. Movies. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's making a horror movie now, and it's getting a lot harder to wade through the shit to find the gems, you know, so to speak. So, right. And, and that's not to discourage anyone. Like I said, I think it's great that people have this technology, but it is kind of, as a film fan, it, it has made it harder at least to find those gems now because there's a lot of people, let's face it, there's a lot of filmmakers out there who don't really care about their product. To them, it is just product and they don't want to put a lot of time or effort into their work and they just shit it out to get it out there, you know? And and that's never been my way. I mean, I'm, I'm an editor by trade. I mean, that's my day job. And, uh, I mean, I spend a lot of time editing these things. I spend a lot of time in post, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I, I wish some other filmmakers would do the same, spend a little more time in post to really tighten up their films and make a good movie, you know, because that's really, you know, you can have a terrible movie. Uh, I put out a movie and I, I, it's not terrible, but, but originally the first edit of this movie was really bad. It's a movie called Purveyors of Blood that I released. Um, a friend of mine made this. And uh, she, she edited it on uh, iMovie, you know, originally. 
and she, she taught herself how to use iMovie and there was so many editing problems and errors and you know but I, I saw I saw something there with this movie I helped work on the movie as well I helped do some camera on it because it's one of those projects she was going to abandon and I was like no I like what you're doing keep working on it you know and um Long story short, I ended up re-editing the entire movie for our DVD release from scratch. I went back to oh. all the original master tapes and re-edited the movie from scratch to make it a better narrative feature because it, you know, the narrative wasn't even quite there in that original cut. And I spent like four or five months editing that movie. And it's really cool to me because now people are seeing that movie and I've seen a ton of great reviews. It's actually gotten a lot of good reviews. Oh, that's and, good. And and people say how fun it is and how cool it is and, and like it feels really good because i'm like i saved that movie you know what i mean because like, <laughs> i think if people would have saw that original cut i don't know if they'd be saying that you know what i mean they they'd probably think it wasn't very good and and all that so you know it's definitely editing is so important when it comes to movies and, and putting the proper time into editing it because even if you messed up something in your shoot if you if you're a good editor you can find ways to make it work you know Sure, sure. Yeah, and 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 for for certain filmmakers, it's it's you know quantity over quality. So it's it's all about you know I you know getting a hundred and twenty credits on IMDb you know as a director, so that person could say, oh look, I'm a director. I've made one hundred and twenty movies. No, you really haven't because probably. 115 of those aren't very good. You know, you, you basically just bashed them out overnight and then within a week they were done. And, you know, and, and so I, you know, yeah, I think that, yeah, you're, you're right that you got to kind of weed through like 200 movies just to find those, those couple good ones. And I've gotten into arguments with people, you know, on, on Facebook where I, you know, where they're like, well, you know, we don't do this because, you know, we, you know, we want to get rich or be known filmmakers. And it's like, well, I kind of do. I mean, it's, I went to film school and, and I, and I want to make films, which is why Axmas and Axmas 2 and Meat Hook and stuff look the way they do is because I want a producer to see them to say, Hey, you know, we, we like your stuff. You know, we want you to make the next Friday or the new Freddy or something like that. So to me, it is putting time into it. And, and if it takes three months to just make a 12 minute short, then, then that's what it takes to make the best product possible instead of three weeks for like a 70 minute feature. And, and I don't think some people get that. I don't think they understand that that's not the way to, I mean, if you want to do that, that's fine. You know, if that's, you know, you love your day job and this is kind of a hobby. Awesome. That's great. But there are certain people out there that, you know, that do want to move on and do something bigger and better. So, and I'm, I'm one of those guys. So. You know, um, yeah, so I got, I, I, oh, go on. So I was just say like, so, so like with me in filmmaking, so to speak, when I was younger, I really wanted to do the same. I wanted to become a filmmaker. I, you know, had this dream of becoming a filmmaker and I ended up, you know, working for a big v VFX company and all that and got to work in the Hollywood system and realized how shitty the Hollywood system is. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and 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 honestly, realized that my taste would never what I liked making. You know, like I'm work, I was working on big Hollywood movies like Man of Steel, and on the side, I'm making Cannibal oh. Corpse three. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, or, or working, you know, on movies w with Tim Ritter and other people doing visual effects on their films. And uh, I kind of realized early on, like. It was never going to be anything for me, and even to this to this day, I don't really consider myself a filmmaker as much as a producer slash distributor. Um, you know, to me, it is a hobby, and uh, I I'm, feel so honored when anyone likes anything I make. You know, but I do always put one hundred and fifty percent into everything because, yeah, I. I want it to be good. I want to make sure. <laughs> of course. Uh, right. I could easily shoot a movie in a weekend if I wanted to. I mean, there's tons of weekend warriors out there who shoot a movie in two days and edit it next week. And then it's out on DVD the following week. You know, <laughs> but they're not very good. And I think ultimately those movies won't stand the test of time, you know. Uh, what shot on video, especially, you know, people are already so judgmental against the genre. There, I mean, a lot of people go to shot on video movies just looking to make in fun of them, you know, that whole so bad right. it's good reputation that people have. And so my thing 
as a filmmaker, so to speak, is I don't want to give people things to make in fun of in my movie. I don't want them to watch my movie and go, oh, those are really shitty production values. Or, oh, you know, that effect looks, you know, doesn't look right or something. Or, hey, this is supposed to take place in the 80s and they're using a modern cell phone. You know, like, I try not to make right. those type <laughs> of mistakes, you know. Yeah, which people do. So it's, it's, but for these type of films, we kind of excuse it because it's low budget, micro budget, you know, that type of thing. So, you know, but, but yeah, you, you can get away from that, you know, just maybe take the camera, turn it a little that way, and then you're avoiding that brand new Porsche that's sitting right there, you know, or something. So, um, okay. So I got just two, two questions left for you. Um, uh, one is then at the end of the film, the special thanks. There are a fair amount of people uh, in there. There's uh, like Brad Twig, there's Joe Sherlock, uh, there's uh, Richard Moog, there's of course Rick, uh, Rick Sloan, which you mentioned, uh, Ron Bonk, uh, Todd Sheets, Tony Newton. Uh, um, that, those are some good names to have as special thanks at the end of your film. Yeah, those are, I mean, all those people are friends and, and colleagues who've helped me out over the years, you know, all, the, all those people, uh, you know, some of them, you know, were the producers of the originals, so with the, that those shorts were contained, and then other people, you know, like Ron Bonk, for example, was just always very helpful with anything. Another guy like, you know, similar to Tim Ritter, you know, he, he'd answer my questions and help give me advice. And even when I started my DVD label, he was extremely helpful. Uh, with me and uh, so yeah I mean you know as they say with movies you know a lot of times I don't I can't pay people I can't afford to pay people I mean all oh, I hear you out of my own pocket <laughs> and, and and yeah you know like a struggling filmmaker you don't make any <laughs> money do you? No. you lose a lot of money but you have a lot of fun and hopefully at the end of the day you made something that makes people get away from their shitty lives and enjoy two hours you know what I mean and so, you know, credits is, is it the easiest way to say thank you for helping out, you know, and I've always been very adamant that like, hey, if you're going to help us out, we're going to make sure we credit you, you know. Right, right. And, that, and that's important to do on, on Axmas, even if I didn't get along with the people anymore or lost touch. And my special thanks were literally every person who I felt helped me. And it could have been when I was 15 years old to get to the point of. I'm now doing credits for Axmas. So let, let's put them in the special thanks. They may never see this, but at least they're there. And, and so that type of stuff is, you know, important. And it is hard to pay people. I mean, even through crowdfunding and all that, it's, it is tough, you know, 20 bucks for gas, you know, or food, you know, give them, you know, yeah, that pizza and beer, you know, or, or take them out to dinner, that type of thing. You know, I, I always give out the DVD. That's, that's one of the things I tell everybody is, you know, I may not be able to pay you or pay you much, but you'll definitely get a copy of the DVD when it's done. You won't have to pay for it. And um, so stuff like that is important. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and I think other people need to realize that. Yeah. I can't tell you how many uh, movies I've worked on where, you know, I get, I've been paid nothing to work on the film and I don't even get a DVD. So, you know, <laughs> I, I do the same thing. I'm always very happy to give DVDs to the filmmakers I work with, even with my distribution. You know, I put out someone's movie, I'll send them free copies. And uh, I think it's really important to, yeah, you know, show your appreciation appreciation that these people helped your vision. Because, you know, a lot of times a filmmaker gets all the credit for the movie, you know, the director or even, you know, the star. There's usually people who stand out who usually get a lot of credit for the movie, but people don't realize it's a whole team of people. Even if right. it's one person's vision, you know, it took that whole team of people. So even down to the guy who was cooking coffee, you know, on the set and making your actors happy that they had their coffee that morning. You know what I mean? That that job's just as important as you yelling cut in action. Sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely agree with that. So yeah, I've, I've worked on sets where if that coffee runs out or they don't have it, it's, it's, that's it. You're, 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 <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a huge mutiny. Um, so the final question would be, uh, what would you like to plug? It could be something for the past, the present, the future. What would you like people to, uh, to look out for? Yeah. So, um, as you kind of mentioned, I run a DVD label. Uh, it's at sovhorror.com. Uh, we, at this point, we've done about 35, 36 releases. 
lots of rare obscure shot on video horror movies uh not just my films you know we've got films like metal noir a lost movie from 1990 movies like mr ice cream man the sob classic from 95 uh horror girl another sob classic you know i feel very humbled and honored to be able to put out these movies and i do it because i love these movies i'm not really making money honestly i keep losing money and I sometimes I question why I even do this but <laughs> I do it because I love the movies and I want people to see these movies so uh definitely check out sobhorror.com and also we talked about Zombrella but there's a sequel uh Natasha Knighty's Boudoir of Blood um that's really great too and that's uh features work by myself as well as uh Jeff Kirkendall uh, who people oh. may know from his work with the Polonia brothers. Yeah. And also Ron Ford, another SOV legend. So, and not oh, so yeah. much in commercials. Yeah. In that one, we had a lot of different people make commercials. A lot of people from indie horror that people might recognize, like Rebecca Reinhardt, Mel Heflin, uh, you know, uh, David Parker, like so many people oh, uh, wow. contribute to that movie. And, you know, I think we really, if you if you like Zombrella's House of Horrors, you got to check out Natasha Knighty because you know I think I learned from the mistakes of the mistakes but you know you learn when you make something and I think I improved the formula and I think the formula like the commercial ratio and everything is just so much better in the sequel and uh, just to close it out I am working on the third in the series so the third in the series is called Spectra the Space Babe uh, oh, oh cool pre-production on that and the joke is, so the joke is too, I don't know if you got it, but it's a different host each time. And, but it's always Fred Olin Woods, Tales from the Mausoleum. So <laughs> Zombrella, it's part one. Uh, Natasha Knight it's part two. Inspector the Space Babe, it will be part three of that. So Okay, all right, that's yeah, cool. <laughs> and I don't want to say too much. There are going to be a lot of other people involved with that. Uh, the only name I'll drop right now is Joe Sherlock. Is oh, nice. Contributing to that one. So, so very excited to be working finally working with joe in that capacity so yeah because you you've released some of his other films too so i, I like joe a lot I, I i work with him uh he does my axmas posters he does the hand uh, drawn axmas posters for me and and uh he's going to be working on uh one of my anthologies a cosmic horror anthology uh called reign of vibrant screams he's contributing one of the shorts to it so yeah i, I like joe a lot I, I, he's a really cool guy yeah, Joe's awesome. I mean, so cool. <laughs> so cool. So, yeah, I'm a big fan. I, I feel honored to, to, to have uh, released a bunch of his movies and try to get them out there for more people to see. And now to get to, I mean, we've worked together numerous times. He gave me actually uh, some of the music that's in uh, uh, Zombrella's House of Horrors, like in the Cannibal Hookers trailers and stuff. A lot of that's from Joe Sherlock. So oh, he's okay. been very helpful. Of two. I, I met him on the retro media forums in the early 2000s and we became friends and, uh, you know, we, we both try to help out each other when we can. You know? Yeah, because he has his own band. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Well, good. Looking forward to part three then. So, um, unless there's anything else, then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Yeah, just say thanks for having me on. And of course, well, thank you. Talk your, about my little movie and, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I hope... Uh, you know, people go check it out and, uh, you know, uh, check out also the other movies we have at SOVHorror.com. Yeah, please, everybody, go go check that stuff out. It's it's pretty good. And and I started off with one or two and now I'm slowly, you know, uh, getting them. So it's it's they're definitely worth it. So they're, they're very interesting. Well made DVDs. So well produced. So. All right, then. Um, uh, so I'm John Ward. And uh, thank you for being here uh, for the latest on uh, One Filmmaker, One Film. And I will see you on the next one. Bye. Thanks, Jeff.